machines by an order of magnitude. That's uh, roughly the, the target of the, all of the next generation uh, proposals, as we've heard. So, and to do that, we basically need to fight with the two parts of the quantum noise, which is the quantum radiation pressure noise, which is limiting sensitivity of the detectors in the low frequencies, below, so, uh, say, so to say, 30 hertz. And we also need to improve the sensitivity <clears throat> at the higher frequencies, because there we have an interesting processes going on in the neutron stars when they collide. And <clears throat> also, it allows to, to see the uh, details of the quasi-normal modes of the ring down phase of the not very massive black holes. So there is a lot of physics going on in the high frequencies as well as and the low frequencies, as we've heard um, in many talks today. OK, so if we want to build a gravitational wave detector which will reach this abundance of new physics, we need to, to do something with this beast. OK. Oops. Is it the right one? No. Going backwards in time. OK. <clears throat> quantum noise. So what is the quantum noise? Basically, this is the fundamental uh, noise source which originates from the uh, inexorable quantum uncertainty uh, of the <clears throat> Of basically phase and amplitude of laser light that we use in uh, gravitational wave detectors to detect the motion of the mirrors. So, and it comes from the duality of the electromagnetic wave uh, as a wave and at the same time a flux of particles of photons. So, if we look closely at our electromagnetic wave, that is basically what we will see, this hairy thing, hairy sinusoidal, is the quantum is basically the quantum noise, and if we want to detect the uh, phase shift imposed by the gravitational wave, we need to do something with this uh, fuzziness. And usually, in uh, quantum optics, the fluctuations of electromagnetic wave are represented on the phase plane, where uh, you plot the location of, the, of your <coughs> amplitude vector uh, in the uh, axis of the amplitude and phase quadrature. So this fuzzy blob, uh, a phaser, represents the <clears throat> geometrical uh, locus of points where uh, electromagnetic field can be found uh, on this plane if you do the measurement. So basically, if you do many, many measurements, so you will end up with this fuzzy cloud. Oops, still not the one. Okay, so, and basically the, the size of this cloud is, cannot be smaller than uh, this one. Or basically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle dictates that the product of the uh, dimension of this blob in this direction and in this direction cannot be smaller than h bar over 2, which limits the minimum area occupied by the quantum state uh, on the phase plane. So if we want, so what, what kind of implications does it have to the detection of a gravitational wave? So if we want to detect the motion, the differential motion of the uh, suspended mirrors of the interferometer, we basically need to measure the phase of the light reflected of these uh, mirrors very precisely. And if we go to the phase plane, that basically means that we have uh, a fuzzy blob that is moving or rotating on the phase plane as a result of the phase shift created by the gravitational wave. And to see <coughs> the motion of this blob, we basically need this blob to move by more than one diameter of itself. So what, what is actually the, the recipe for doing it better? Apparently, uh, you can discern smaller angles if the stick or the amplitude of the laser uh, which this blob is sitting on, so it's long enough. Basically meaning that you need to increase the power or the amplitude of light which is impinging the mirror. 
Or, at the same time, it means that basically increase the number of photons hitting the mirror. And by this, you can decrease the, what is called short noise. Okay, but unfortunately, that is not the whole story. Uh, and another process, which is basically coming from the <clears throat> fact that the photons of the, of the light hitting the mirror and making it move randomly. So they create additional source of noise, and this leads to the fuzzy blob being transformed into the fuzzy ellipse. And this process is called the uh, pondromotive squeezing, which is, in the quantum optics, uh, the way to say that you have a radiation pressure noise. So, and the result of this will be the rise of, uh, of quantum noise at lower frequencies where the mirror is responding uh, more to the, um, to the stochastic force applied by the uh, randomly kicking it photons. Okay, so, but what else shall we know about the uh, pondromotive squeezing and what, what else shall we know about the radiation pressure? So basically, the radiation pressure part, if you write down the input-output relations, so the, that will be the amplitude quadrature of the outgoing light as it depends on the uh, amplitude quadrature of the ingoing light, and that is the phase quadrature of the outgoing light, and you see that because of the radiation pressure, it has this component, so it depends on the amplitude quadrature of the ingoing light, and that causes the squeezing I was talking about, and what is even worse, this thing is frequency dependent and at different frequencies it causes different, different kind of squeezing of the outgoing light if the ingoing light is just a coherent state. So here you see the plot of the angle of rotation of these squeeze ellipses at the output of the detector and this is the squeezing factor of these ellipses as a function of frequency. So yeah. Sorry, there should be a frequency here, frequency divided by the bandwidth of the, <coughs> of the interferometer. So this is the frequency equal to the bandwidth of the interferometer. And you see that at low frequencies, the pondromotive squeezing is actually becoming infinite. And that is the main problem we have to, uh, to fight with. Okay, so how can we do that? Apparently, changing the power doesn't help because increasing the power, you reduce the short noise, but at the same time, you increase the radiation pressure noise proportionally. And this results into the uh, sort of a limit which is imposed to the uh, measurement of the motion of the mirrors if you just measure the phase quadrature. This is, this is known as a standard quantum limit, and we have to break this standard quantum limit if we want to go uh, to the next generation of detectors. So now, when we roughly know what is the quantum noise and uh, how, it, how it looks like at the output of the detector, so basically it is a squeezed state with the frequency-dependent squeezing and frequency-dependent squeezing factor at the same time. So there are strategies how to uh, improve the sensitivity of the detectors that were developed in the recent time. So the most obvious one is to change the quantum state of light that enters the interferometer. That basically means that we need to substitute the vacuum which enters the dark part of the interferometer by the squeezed light. Since we have a frequency dependent uh, pondromotive squeezing, in order to uh, mitigate it at different frequencies, we need a frequency dependent squeezing. And the most modern and <clears throat> fashionable technique is EPR squeezing. I will talk about it. Then, you can modify the outgoing light. So basically, you just uh, manipulate the light which is going outside of the interferometer in an optimal way by measuring the right quadrature of it at different frequencies. So, and this uh, means that there are two different techniques. The variational readout, also quite old and known well since 2000, <clears throat> and this new fashion 
thing is the negative mass spin-based filters I will briefly talk about if I have time. <clears throat> then you can change this quantum state, quantum state of light inside the interferometer. So that is also a very interesting and uh, still under development, I mean theoretically, uh, technique of internal squeezing. So basically putting the squeezer inside the interferometer or nonlinear crystal. So, and there is another thing which is uh, unstable optomechanical filters which allows to uh, suppress the short noise without actually changing the peak sensitivity. So without um, increasing the bandwidth of the interferometer without changing the finesse of the cavities. Also interesting thing. Well, and then the ultimate thing uh, that can be done is the, uh, change the interaction Hamiltonian or the way the light interacts with the mirrors in such a way to perform a so-called quantum non-demolition measurement. And one of the examples of this is a speed meter. I will not talk about the change in the dynamics. Uh, that also can be done, uh, but that actually doesn't uh, treat the quantum noise, rather it modifies the signal. Okay, so squeezing. As I said, you can basically uh, inject squeeze light into the dark portal of the interferometer and that, if you squeeze it in a proper way, that will allow you to measure this angle much better because you squeeze in the phase quadrature. Unfortunately, that doesn't work well for the, again, for the uh, low frequencies where, because of the ponderomotive squeezing, uh, the light is squeezed <coughs> in, the, in another quadrature, in the orthogonal one, and just injecting the fixed squeezing leads to the same effect as increasing or decreasing the power. So you can suppress uh, quantum noise in narrow band by injecting the squeezing at 45 degrees, but again, you lose at high and low frequencies simultaneously. <clears throat> well, the solution to that was suggested again in 2001 uh, in the famous Kimball et al. paper. So you basically look at what is the squeezing angle that should be injected into the interferometer to optimally <coughs> reduce the uncertainty of quantum fluctuations. And it turns out to be uh, amplitude squeezing at low frequencies, phase squeezing at uh, high frequencies, and intermediate squeezing in between. So <coughs> basically, what you will get is wide band uh, suppression of the quantum noise by the same factor in all frequencies. That can be done by letting the light from the squeezer, the vacuum, squeeze vacuum from the squeezer, to go through the dispersive uh, medium or a dispersive uh, kind of device, like a fabrifero cavity, which rotates the uh, squeezing angle at different frequencies of the sidebands. So there are some problems with that because additional device between the squeezer and the interferometer means more loss and loss is detrimental for quantum correlations, which is basically squeezing. So, and another problem is that the frequency at which the rotation has, been, has to be done, which is defining the uh, bandwidth of the filter cavity is actually quite low. It's around 100 or uh, several tens of hertz. And that means that this should be either a very long cavity or a very high finesse cavity, which also means that it is more susceptible to loss. Well, the fancy new version of it. So how to solve the problem of loss in the filter cavity? Why don't we use, instead of filter cavity, the, the cavity which is definitely has a very low uh, loss which is the arm cavities of the interferometer itself. So the idea which came from Ichu Ma and his colleagues from Caltech was the following. So why don't we create with a uh, nonlinear crystal the uh, entangled beams, which are called signal and idler beams, which are separated in frequency by uh, some several megahertz. Um, and one of the, the signal beam 
is resonant with interferometer and with the carrier light, while the uh, idler beam at higher frequency will just also enter the interferometer, but it will not beat with the carrier light because it is several megahertz apart, but it will still experience the higher uh, order airy peaks or uh, resonances of the interferometer and will see the interferometer as a filter cavity. And then, by separating the outgoing light uh, using these two output mode cleaners, by measuring the amplitude quadrature of the outgoing light, actually, yeah, I think if you measure the amplitude quadrature, you will project the <clears throat> uh, signal light at different frequencies into the right quadrature. So that will basically do the same job as the filter cavity, but at the expense. So the expense is that you always have a fee of 3 dB because of the entangled nature of, this, um, of these two beams. And there is a problem of optical losses in the readout train. So you basically have to keep the optical paths of the two uh, parts of this of this play of the idler and the signal um, very very stable with respect to each other otherwise it doesn't work it introduces additional correlations uh, additional noise uh, destroying the correlations between the uh, the two entangled beams which you use for obtaining uh, improvement and sensitivity okay so now what if we modify the okay oh yeah so, what if we modify the um, <clears throat> outgoing light? So, basically, we can, as you remember, uh, there was a ponderomotively squeezed light which had different squeezing angles at uh, different um, frequencies. And if you send the light going out of the interferometer through the filter cavity, and this filter cavity optimally aligns all the uh, noise ellipses along the same quadrature, and then you measure the orthogonal one, basically this one, which has the minimum uncertainty, not the phase one, which has the maximum one. So then, in principle, you can completely remove the uh, radiation pressure noise. And that is very important thing to know, that basically this is the best you can do uh, this kind of suppression. This is the best you can do fundamentally uh, for the given amount of power and given squeezing. And this is called the fundamental quantum limit or quantum Kramerau bound. So you cannot do better than that. But as you can see from the, from the same plot, so basically if you have loss, this technique is very, very susceptible to it. So and all the advantage is lost. Yes, that I already said. <clears throat> then another, uh, another type of um, approach is basically uh, put the nonlinear crystal inside the interferometer because, as it's thought, uh, you can do better with making squeezing inside the interferometer because you don't have interfaces between the squeezer and interferometer where the most loss is happening. So you get rid of the injection loss. And additionally, this thing can act as a parametric amplifier so it can also amplify its sidebands and create a higher uh, frequency optical spring. So, what else? Unstable filters. So, I have to rush. Um, unstable filters is another fancy thing. So, basically, instead of uh, doing the optical squeezing, you do an optomechanical squeezing or something like this. So, you introduce at the output of the interferometer um, the device which uh, has a mechanical micro oscillator as one of the mirrors and this mechanical micro oscillator with combination of the control laser light it creates a negative dispersion for the outgoing light so basically it counter counterbalances the positive dispersion of the arm cavities so this is what the uh, dispersion curve of the optomechanical filter look like and when they are combined so they basically introduce the dispersion-free kind of propagation of signal sidebands 
inside the interferometer and outside, increasing the bandwidth of the interferometer, keeping the same uh, peak sensitivity. Well, there are certain pro problems with that approach if you try to make a, to build a um, gravitational wave detector, uh, third generation one with it. So the main R is that thermal noise of this small mirror is directly down converted into the signal sidebands, while also this device introduces some additional optical poles, which if you want to use the frequency dependent squeezing, means that instead of one filter cavity or two filter cavities, like for a detuned Fabry Per Michelson, you actually need to use three filter cavities, and that is the kind of curve that you can obtain with it. Well, so uh, another interesting way of suppressing the radiation pressure was proposed by Farid and Eugen Polzik <clears throat> recently. Basically, letting light uh, from the laser to go through the system, which behaves almost exactly like the gravitational wave detector, but for the, uh, so it has the same kind of response, but for the sign of this response. So basically, the spin ensemble cell uh, can be made to behave like a suspended mirror, but with a negative mass. And this is exactly producing the ponderomotive kind of uh, squeezing of the opposite sign. And if you do that, if you let the light through this system and then let it into the interferometer, potentially it can, it can uh, completely cancel the radiation pressure noise. The problem that there are no spin systems at the moment that operate at 1064 nanometers, neither at 2 micron or 1550. So they all operate at um, frequencies uh, of the visible light. And therefore, to use this technology, again, the entanglement has to be uh, employed. And you have to create two entangled beams. One is going to interferometer, one is going to the spin ensemble. And then by measuring the light going out of the spin ensemble, you project the light going into the interferometer into the desired frequency dependent squeeze state. So that is, uh, again, imposes the same kind of uh, fees and levies as EPR entanglement. OK, the speed meters, that you've already heard a lot from me. So basically, if you measure, uh, instead of displacement, uh, the velocity of the mirrors, the result of this will be, as shown here, you suppress the radiation pressure because the light, which measures the mirror in front, produces the kick, the radiation pressure, which is canceled by the kick at the second measurement. And the result of this will be the suppression of the radiation pressure. And what is most important, it's happening inside the interferometer. So there is nothing happening outside, and there is no interface. So the price to pay is lower uh, response at low frequencies. OK. And it is one of the most developed uh, of the methods, because just out of the sheer number of configurations that we proposed, I will skip through it. So that is what you can get uh, with this device. The improvement factor in the um, event rate can be up to 300 compared to the, uh, the Michelson interferometer. And the, the new species, the polarization-based uh, speed meters, they allow to make almost no changes to the Michelson interferometer, but for the uh, problem of the coatings having the same, the same um, reflectivity and phase relations uh, for both polarizations. OK, so that was the tour de force uh, through the currently uh, accessible quantum noise mitigation technologies. So I will not uh, use more time reading the summary and just leave it here. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Um, concerning the uh, variational readout, the, the requirements in terms of, of the 
uh, additional uh, cavity are the same as in the case of the, I mean, uh, filter cavity? Uh, yes. Yeah, so same product length times uh, finesse. Yes, uh, okay. the same requirements in terms of the um, parameters. I mean, the, the, the line width and the detuning, which is required, is the same. But the requirements for the loss is much more stringent if you want to, to get the same sensitivity. Even worse. So uh, filter cavities are also a problem uh, for future detectors because of uh, uh, a cost. Not the filter itself, uh, itself but uh, you have space. to make uh, yeah, space. Uh, so if you in a T are uh, a nightmare. So uh, um, from your long list of technologies, uh, two of them uh, seems to me quite uh, appealing in terms of uh, absence uh, of uh, filter cavities uh, that are uh, uh, the EPR squeezing and the speed meters. So if you have to point uh, your uh, remaining money on, uh, on uh, one of the two technologies, what, uh, what are you are thinking about? Uh, well, that's a difficult, difficult question. Um, I think um, it's not the right way to ask the question because they are compatible. You can, you, can use, you can use actually EPR squeezing in speed meters at the same time. And um, I think given the, that we developed the polarization speed meters, which doesn't require to change infrastructure. Uh, so it's just the, the same Michelson interferometer, just the mirrors should have the same uh, qualities for two orthogonal polarizations and the beam splitter, most importantly. <clears throat> so in terms of space, there is no change. So why not do both? All right, if there are no other, Eugen, yes. There's a Eugen question? No, no, not really. I can, I can follow up. Uh, no. I was uh, uh, curious about the micro mirror kind of uh, um, um, uh, system that you, you were Unstable. considering. Yeah, then stable cavity. You said, of course, the thermal noise in the micro mirror is, is, is really a big uh, challenge. Yes. But c c can I have, a, sorry, uh, an idea of, uh, of the kind of uh, string requirements that you set? I mean, uh, more or less just. Well, that is the requirement. Uh, okay. So it's a temperature over the quality factor of the mechanical oscillator. So that should be 10 to minus 10. So it's. Millikelvins, at least, and very high, yeah. high quality mechanical resonator. All right, let's thank Stefan again. Thank you. Uh,